Today is the second Sunday after Easter. And the epistle reading is taken from the first epistle of St. Peter. Um, Dearly beloved, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile. When he suffered, he threatened not, but delivered himself to him that judged him unjustly, who his own self bore our sins in his body upon the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live to justice, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but you are now converted to the shepherd and bishop of your soul. We stand for the gospel. The gospel reading is taken from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But the hireling, and he that is not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, Seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf then catcheth, and scattereth the sheep. And the hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and hath no care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me, as the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep, and other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Good Shepherd, of course, is an analogy, it's a comparison. And the sense is that we are to Christ as sheep are to their shepherds, which means that there's a proportionality between the way sheep are related to their shepherd and the way the disciples are related to Christ. Technically, it's analogy and analogy of metaphorical proportionality. Jesus tells us, I am the good shepherd. And the Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now that text is even stronger than the synoptic parable of the lost sheep. Remember that parable emphasized the lengths to which the shepherd would go to find one sheep that was lost. Here the Good Shepherd goes one step further and lays down his life for his sheep. The marauding wolf who goes among the sheep to scatter them and to snatch them and to kill them is Satan, the devil. Remember that Satan is referred to in scripture as a murderer from the beginning. And St. Peter warns us that the devil, our adversary, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And of course, Satan and the demons will continue this predation until the second coming of Jesus Christ and the general judgment in Ultima Dei. So the history of the church here on earth and the history of each Christian here on earth is an ongoing struggle against Satan and those who choose to follow him. We have a very, very clear example of that here in San Francisco. Chronicle, and published probably in hell. The hireling, or the mercenary, whom Christ describes, is a reference to the Pharisees and to the temple priests. In fact, earlier in the same discourse, Jesus had attacked the Pharisees and the temple priests as thieves and bandits. He called them careless gatekeepers 
And he referred to them as strangers whom the sheep do not know and whom they will not follow. Similar condemnations of religious authorities who betray their calling are found throughout the Old Testament. For example, in Jeremiah we read, Woe to the pastors that destroy and maul the sheep of my pasture, thus saith the Lord. And Jeremiah continues, My people have become a lost flock, their shepherds have caused them to go astray and to forget their true and native pastures. And in the book of Ezekiel, God denounces the shepherds, the religious leaders of the people, and their temporal rulers, who have not cared for the flock, and he accuses it of plundering it, neglecting the weak, and the sick, and the strain. And so we read, and so they were scattered for want of a shepherd, and became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with no one to seek them out or search for them. Now, God's response to this betrayal on the part of the religious leaders of Israel in the Old Testament is a promise that God makes through the prophet. God promises that he will take his flock away from these wicked shepherds and most importantly, that God himself will come and be their shepherd. And so we read, I shall lead them out of the nations and gather them from the countries. I shall bring them to their own land, and I myself will tend them on the mountains of Israel. I myself shall feed them with good pasture. I myself shall be the shepherd of my sheep, sheep and I will seek out those who are lost. So God is promising here that he himself will come and be the shepherd of his sheep. And God says again to the prophet, And you are my sheep, the sheep of my flock, and I am your God and your shepherd. Jesus then, in identifying himself as the good shepherd, is actually the fulfillment in person of God's promise in the Old Testament. Because the second person of the Blessed Trinity has come in an assumed human nature to function as the shepherd of his flock. And remember that so much of what Jesus does and so much of what he says has its antecedent in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is basically a preparation for the coming of Christ. And so the Old Testament is filled with types of Christ, analogies to Christ, foreshadowings and precursors of Christ. One cannot understand the full sense of the Old Testament unless one understands exactly how it is a sketch, as it were, an outline of Jesus Christ. Then the discourse continues, and Jesus describes those who belong to his sheepfold. In describing those who belong to his sheepfold, he says, I know my sheep, and mine know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, because they recognize my voice. So this is what distinguishes those who belong to the sheepfold of Jesus and those who do not belong to it. Now, this kind of knowledge and recognition that our Lord describes belongs entirely to the supernatural order. It is an effect or result of supernatural grace. It is given with the giving of supernatural sanctifying grace. And Christ emphasizes the supernatural character of this sort of knowledge that distinguishes his sheep by stating that this knowledge is analogous to the knowledge of the Father and the Son within the Trinity. 
So some authors have referred to this as a knowledge by way of congeniality. St. Thomas refers to it as a knowledge by way of connaturality. This kind of knowledge is a knowledge, St. Thomas says, that proceeds from supernatural faith, which enlightens the intellect, and is motivated by, motivated by supernatural charity, which inflames the will. And those to whom this supernatural gift of recognition is given are transformed by God's grace, both ontologically, that is to say, in their being, and consequently in their operation, operatio sequitur esse, the operation of the thing follows its being. They are transformed in being and in action so that their inclinations, their dispositions, and their abilities of discernment are so attuned to God that they are able to rightly discern God's will in the choices that they make. And this gift, again, of supernatural faith, together with supernatural charity, that is what radically distinguishes those who belong to Christ from those who do not. And keep in mind now that the supernatural virtues of faith and of charity these supernatural theological virtues are given only in baptism. Of course, there is baptism of water, there is baptism of blood, and there is baptism of desire, as the Council of Trent teaches. From this, it clearly follows that baptism, together with supernatural faith and supernatural charity, these are indispensably necessary for salvation. If one does not die in the state of supernatural faith and supernatural charity, then one cannot be saved. And this is what the Church has always taught. This is what the Scriptures, which after all belong to the Church, they come from the Church, has always taught. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. And St. John, in his prologue, lists the two necessary conditions for salvation. Those who believe in the name of Jesus and are born not of the will of man nor of the will of the flesh, but of the will of God. And that rebirth, of course, signifies baptism. And those who believe in his name and are born again in baptism, to these he gives the power to become sons of God. Now, of course, that teaching raises inevitably the question regarding those who are invincibly ignorant of Christ and his church, those who through no fault of their own do not know Christ, do not know the church, and they have no practical access to knowledge about Christ and the Church and the sacraments. What about these people? These people who are invincibly ignorant. Now you know that invincible ignorance of Christ and His Church actually intensifies and increases guilt because invincible ignorance is ignorance that can be overcome. It's ignorance of which one is aware but one chooses not to take the means to overcome it. Invincible ignorance means that for all practical purposes, there is no way that person can go from ignorance to knowledge in this respect, at least not now. Now, we know that with regard to these people, there is such a thing as baptism of blood and baptism of desire. And those two forms of baptism, although they're not the sacrament, do have the same supernatural effect as the sacrament of baptism. They confer sanctifying grace, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And many theologians write about the possibility of an implicit faith in Christ, as distinguished from an explicit faith in Christ. 
though very few would go so far as to say that atheists can be saved, because by an atheist we mean someone who is aware of the concept of God, or aware of the knowledge of God, has some knowledge of God, and clearly and directly rejects God. Now it's possible that such a person has such a warped concept of God that in rejecting his notion of God, he's not rejecting God as God is. The Church really has not given us any definition on this matter. It doesn't matter. All we need to know is that our role as disciples of Christ, as sheep that do belong to his flock, our role is to go out to recruit other sheep from the sheepfold of Christ. It's our mission from the very fact that we're baptized and confirmed. It's our mission to go out to those sheep who are not of this fold and to evangelize and to proselytize and to convert them to Christ. Finally, in this discourse, Jesus looks forward to the day when there will be one sheepfold and one shepherd. Now, that text has been understood in a number of ways. Some authors understand it as referring to the day when the Jews will be collectively, that is to say, as a group converted, so that there will be Jew and Christian together, Christian Jews having become Christian in the one flock. But the best understanding, I think, of that text is to understand it as a reference to the last day, the day of judgment, the day when there will be a definitive separation of the sheep from the goats, of the good from the wicked. And on that day, there will be an ingathering of all the just. Christ will bring all his sheep, all those who belong to his sheepfold, into everlasting pastures. And on that day, of course, as you know from St. Matthew's Gospel, Christ will say to those who do belong to him, he will say to them, Come, ye blessed of my Father, into the kingdom prepared for you before the beginning of the world. But to those who have rejected him, he will say, Depart ye cursed into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and for his angels. Secundum Scripturas, 
et ascendit in celum, sedet ad exteram patris, et miserum venturus est cum gloria. Iudicare vivos et mortus, cuius regni non erit finis, et in spiritum sanctum dominum, et vivi picantem, qui ex patre filio que procedi, qui cum patre el filio simula donatur, et con glorificatur, qui locutus est per profetas, et una santa catolica, et apostolica ecclesia, on fide orundu baptisma, in remissione peccatorum, et expectorum, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Dici bun 